Good morning and welcome to the Sabi Sands. We're on Juma and Arethusa here in South Africa. I'm Scott Dyson. Morning everyone, my name is Peter Pretorius and it is an absolutely glorious morning. We had beautiful sunshine to start with and a bit of cloud covering it and it just broke through with like a minute ago. So yeah, it's going to be a good one. Yep, so good cool weather from the, the cloud cover. Hopefully the predators will be active for us this morning and everything else I'm sure will be Happy to be enjoying this cool weather and good conditions. Not a breath in the air. Yeah, no, this is perfect. I mean, yesterday we had a beautiful afternoon. I, I kept going on about it being like a postcard. We had these blue skies, puffy clouds. This morning we've got a bit more cloud cover, but I don't think anything we have to be too concerned about in terms of rain. So, so perfect, perfect cat weather. Nice light, nice and cool. You can see we're even wearing jackets still probably for the next half an hour or so. And we're going to look around a little bit. I want to go to the west a bit later on. Um, I think we can, I'll just zip past the lions. I'm sure you're going to go see those cats as well. Yeah. And um, yeah, maybe find a leopard or two. Who knows? Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. I'm craving a leopard. So that is high up on my list of things to do this morning. Perfect, guys. Just in case maybe this is your first drive with, um, with us here in, in South Africa, uh, your first safari live experience. Keep in mind, you can talk to us as well. You can ask questions either by emailing to questions at Wild Earth or uh, tweeting at hashtag safari live. And that just makes for a nice conversation. If you are just driving around, we're looking for a few things. Maybe you're curious about something we're seeing. You know, Scott and myself, uh, send us a question through and we can chat to you. And um, just say hello as well. It's nice to know where people are from um, on the drive. Sounds good. Perfect. I'm ready to go, Let's Pete. Let's go look around, have fun. We'll, we'll probably see each other out there somewhere. I'm sure we will. Yeah. Good luck, have fun. Yeah. Oh, and um, Jason on camera, VM on camera, Will Fox back in control. Okay, see you later. All right. <laughs> um, yo, this light that's just come through is amazing. You get this beautiful filtered light after rain or after clouds. And we've got nice dark cloud on the sort of northern horizon, north and northeastern horizon. So I think VM can just quickly show you that. It's quite a dramatic backdrop. And then we'll get, we'll get rolling. Oh, I love that sun flare you're getting. So a spectacular afternoon, uh, spectacular morning really afternoon or evening for some of you perhaps all right let's go look around sorry guys I just whenever I look you I'm gonna see that in one second to have your eyes nice and clear in the morning I love the morning drives via myself on the way over we're talking about um, just you know how beautiful it is in the morning at the moment sunrise is actually shortly after five o'clock and uh, it's just I just love it in the morning I have a friend that used to always say that I was just thinking that about um, cleaning your eyes now cleaning the lens used to say if my eyes are clear I can do anything and uh, clear eyes in the morning are very worthwhile that was Rory Johnson that always said that if you knew him you'd maybe <laughs> have a little chuckle in that comment he always said if my eyes are clear I can do anything so we've got clear eyes this morning beautiful skies beautiful morning to look around for and um, I'm looking forward to getting a bit sort of spots we haven't really been much the last couple of days there's been so much activity hey it's my ear they have spoken earpiece in um, there's been so much activity around sort of close to home with the lions I mean, pulled at someone about that they think you're joking unless of course they saw it with you that's the brilliant part of this if people shared that then uh, it's a shared experience Let's, actually, this is something we've wondered about. So if, if one or two or three or five or ten or... or however many would like to answer, 
Um, we were just talking last night about, I wonder how many people told and the, the lion buffalo hunt, but I mean, for that matter, it can also be the leopard, uh, you know, Penuma walking right into the campfire chat and sitting on the tree having a look at us while we're Aiden and myself are chatting and, um, or any of the drives, really, any of the experiences. I'd be curious to know how many of you have told friends or family or, you know, people close to you or people not close to you at work, wherever, in the last 72 hours about the experience you've had with um, the wild earth here and in South, in South East Sand. So, if a couple of you could just let us know if you have. I mean, maybe no one has. Maybe, maybe you didn't. But um, it would be fun to know if some of you or how many of you told friends about it and said, listen, you must check this out because it's quite fun. <coughs> you want to let us know again, hashtag Safari Live. Tweeting seems to be quite the easy way to go. Or questions at wildearth.tv if you want to email. Just going to quickly switch us just caught in the open and they were just lazing around really. But it was a feeling of they sort of heading out as a team. They were all five of them, they were very much in sort of, you know. Um, we call it combat formation, you know, they're really much like a, like a crack unit, you know, working as a team, walking along and so on. So, I'm quite curious to see if they're back this morning. There was a lot of food left still. Now, typically they would stay on that food for another few days, but at the same time, we've certainly seen that these guys don't have any problems with hunting. There's their tracks. I didn't see it on quarantine. Excuse me. <coughs> Yeah, the track's coming down. So they did come down the road here. Quarantine or the first part of Philemon's cut line. So just thinking where they would have gone from there. Maybe they've cut up. Let's go have a look at the carcass. That's an easy place to start. Sounds like a good plan. I just want to quickly show you these tracks here. If you look just in front of the shadows here, there in that area. Okay, yeah, I'm just going to not go forward because that's the beautiful thing about tracking is it works best early morning, late afternoon because you've still got the shadows, you've still got the contrast. Once the sun gets up a bit high, it gets trickier. But those lines are walking in our direction, so the opposite way from what we're driving at the moment. And there you've got one, two, three, four toes and the pad in the back area. And... Um, if I get another lion track or leopard track at some stage, maybe in some muddy ground that it makes like a perfect cast print, I will show you the lobes and they'll talk about the track a bit more. But these are nice, I mean, they're not massive lions yet, but nice big tracks. I mean, they would be about that size if you look at them, if they open the nails a bit bigger than my hand. So, you yeah, know, big cats. Um, we're going to move along and I think I've just got something to tell you and show you. So enjoy the drive with him and we'll let you know soon about these lions. Welcome back folks, what a beautiful sight we have here. Big male giraffe that we've actually seen before. Really is looking good in this morning sunshine. You'll notice his step is not very fluid. He does have quite a considerable limp. Um, if we try and have a closer look at his back right knee, we can actually see some scars that were potentially from a lion attack. Um, there we go, good work, Jason. You can see those scars there, so... I mean, that doesn't look too bad. Those look just like flesh wounds, but that potentially had some influence on, on the limp that he, he's carrying now. I'm sure if push came to shove and he needed to move quickly, he, he certainly would be able to, though. Also, we have some zebra following the giraffe. And I think 
If I was a zebra, I'd also feel a lot more safe and comfortable knowing that I was walking around with some five to six meter giants keeping an eye on, keeping an eye out for any predators. The sunlight this morning really is beautiful. Well, that was a very pleasant surprise on our way to the hyena den site. That is the initial plan for, for myself and Jason this morning, to go and have a quick look at the, at the den sites and see if there's any activity. It tends to be quite erratic in terms of when it's active and when it's not. Um, hyenas' lifestyles cause them to have a kind of lack of routine, because they are scavengers, you could find that the mother is waiting under a tree next to a leopard or standing by next to a, potentially the lion kill waiting for any scraps, so hard to tell when she will be, be, be back at the den, but hopefully the youngster will be there. There is only one way to find out, and that's by going and having a look, so we shall continue. It's so good to be out again this morning after Jigo got drenched in the monsoon two nights ago. We didn't want to take any chances yesterday morning by starting her up. So I was out of action yesterday and I really missed uh, being out here with you guys. On the way back to the camp last night, Hayden and Will managed to spot an African rock python, which I'm highly jealous about. Um, for those of you who have been following the last few, few drives that I've been taking, I've always mentioned that it would be nice to see a snake, especially an African rock python. So they are about, one was seen last night. So fingers crossed we'll get visual of one. They really are incredibly beautiful snakes. And the nice thing about them is that even if they are tiny, they're beautiful, and if they're six meters, then they're still beautiful, but really impressive, because six meters of snake is a spectacle to behold. In this area of South Africa, though, in Africa, the largest ones I've seen in the Sabi Sands are around the four meter mark. They could well get bigger here, but in my history in this area, typically around four meters and about that thick. So a considerable chunk of snake. At this time of the year, it's not uncommon to find them with a young impala kill. It's kind of, I guess, a relatively easy prey item for them. And scary to think that even the, that the, the large four or five meter pythons can consume a fully grown impala, even a male with the horns. Yes, we've got a hyena ahead of us, and we're not even close to the den site, so hopefully we'll be able to follow it all the way back or to wherever it's going. Maybe it'll lead us to something else.
there it goes. I think it is back to the den site, which is about 600 meters in this direction. We would usually access it from another road, but let's follow it and see where it takes us. Where it takes us. It is heading back to the den site, so let's try and get there at the same time that it arrives. Wouldn't that be nice? Sorry, Jason. I think it will beat us. Oh, I think it will beat us back there, but let's see what we can do. That looked like a youngster. I'm not sure if it's the usual youngster that we see at the den sites. It is getting to an age, I think, that it would start to venture out from the den um, in little steps until finally it will be following the rest of the clan out on their missions. just saw some tracks on the road that I needed to double check to make sure they weren't leopard or lion but they were in fact hyena. What a beautiful view we have. Oh, missed the turn off. But look at that for a beautiful vista. Even though lion and hyena are kind of regarded as eternal enemies. I'm sure the hyena in this area are enjoying the fact that the Birmingham boys provided a lot of extra left you know, over the past few days with the three buffalo kills that they've made. Oh, spider web. the hyena and it is on the way. He spotted the spotted hyena and there's more than one which is great. Wonderful. So the mother and the youngster are on their way back and haven't we just lucked out with the timing. Gonna get my binoculars out and have a closer look at the mother from a distance. It looks like she's full bellied. Of full bellied with meat and full bellied with babies potentially and now the third one's just around beautiful we'll just wait for them to arrive and establish where they're gonna relax and do their thing before we move the vehicle around too much The 
this youngster's not taking any chances. You could see it was listening intently, making sure it was safe, whoever was arriving. Okay. Just reposition quickly. It's interesting that she's headed straight to the den and she is poking her head in there quite curiously. So who knows whether she's actually given birth already. It's tall if anyone but her nipple. do show that she potentially has already been suckled. Um, it's very difficult for me to say whether she has given birth already, but that her behavior kind of leads me to think that potentially she has. Good to see the two youngsters enjoying one another's company. A great comparison to have individuals of three different sizes like because you can really see how their coat does change in color and pattern as they do become older. They start off as pitch black tiny little fur balls. Early as on the black fades to spots and even then, as time goes on further, the spots fade out to a browner color. As we can see with the mother here, the spots are a lot less prominent or dark relative to the young cubs. Just got a question through from Alicia on email. She sent that all the way from Ontario, Canada. And Alicia's asked, do hyenas laugh? And the short answer to that is yes. They do have a kind of high-pitched laughing cackle that they use when they are becoming ex um, This could be if, if and when they find a carcass, whether it be a, with a leopard up a tree or interacting with lions and wild dog, it's, it's a vocalization that they make typically when they are very excited and they also use it to kind of overpower or scare off potential enemies that they, they are trying to steal carcasses or kills from. So you could imagine 20 or 30 hyena together, and you do get clans that big in certain parts of Africa, all cackling and laughing, and it's quite a hysterical 
noise that could overpower or scare off any predators from their kills. So the answer is yes, and they are sometimes even termed or called laughing hyena, but more commonly known as the spotted hyena. But that is a good question, Alicia, and I could wish for nothing more than for them to do this, this laughing cackle. I haven't heard it for a while, and it is typically used, like I say, in times of high excitement, which typically means good action for us, the viewers. Um, we'll hold thumbs, Alicia, because if we do get to, to hear that, I, I would really be happy. Thank you very much for that. Another question's just come through from Linda in Ohio. Linda, on board, questionably given birth, would she allow the other cubs or, or sub-adults into the burrow or the den sites? Um, in my history, I have noticed that they do share the, the den sites with the different ages, but the youngest one that we have seen this morning would probably be the only one that would go in to the den site and that would be to just kind of check up on its younger brothers or sisters um, but there's no hard and fast rule and typically when they do become bigger they don't have too much of a requirement to go down into the den site. Um, the young cubs should start poking their head out in about two weeks after uh, being born but I think uh, it's definitely fair to say that the mother will tolerate other youngsters going down into the den site, but it does depend all on the, the individual circumstance. With smaller clans like we, we are seeing here, I think it would be more likely for her to allow others down into the, the den. Whereas in bigger clans where you can have 20 to 30 members, I think the, the, the alpha female would potentially have a little bit more of a of a ruling and a and a system in place allowing deciding who can go down into the den because uh, with hyena hierarchy it, a lot depends on the the genetics of of who was born and when females being more dominant than males and a lot of competition is is often felt between or experienced between the different members of the clan jostling for positions so you could find that an older female would sense a threat from a younger female cub and therefore the mother may intervene and prevents the older female from potentially even killing a young cub but as we can see here it's a happy camp, everyone's playful. Another question has come through from Tony asking me if I've seen a brown hyena. And I'll just continue with that shortly. He's coming so close to us. Wow, look at this, folks. So inquisitive. And they've got such a powerful sense of smell. Everything we've driven over on our way here, which obviously is of no interest to us, may provide some kind of interest to them.
of tyres essentially acting like a, a newspaper, bringing in lots of new information to them. And a lot of people ask um, why the animals have no kind of reaction to the vehicle when we start it up or why have they become so accustomed to us. And this is a good example as to why. This little cub that we can see here, from when it was even younger than this, was slowly getting exposed to vehicles, learning that we don't pose any threat to them. We never feed them so they don't associate us, associate us with food. So we just fit into a kind of neutral slot in the ecosystem, which is very rare out here in the wild. Typically either animals are enemy or prey. But from spending hours and hours with animals from a young age, it does really allow us to get some incredible views and close-up interaction like we're experiencing now. Wouldn't it be wonderful to know what's going through this little guy's head? It's looking out at some Egyptian geese that are flying past in the distance. Sorry, Tony, back to your question about the brown hyena. Yes, I have seen brown hyena, not very many in my life. Um, you don't get them in this area, and this is where I have spent the majority of my guiding career in the Sabi Sands, South Africa. Um, but no, you, do, you sadly do not get brown hyena here, and I actually cannot remember when last I did see one. I think it was in the Karoo, which is kind of semi-desert area in south-central Southern Africa. I'm just going to reposition the vehicle potentially because two yards about behind us. stay focused on this slightly older one. Well, here's the cub, the youngest cub just ahead of us. And I'm guessing it's going to soon head back to his older brother or sister. I'm not sure which it is, whether it is a male. Um, but what I can tell you is that the youngster will certainly enjoy the older sibling as a playmate. And I think we may be in for a little bit of playtime right now, which would be wonderful. <laughs> Reason why it is difficult to tell the gender of hyenas is both male and female have very similar looking genitalia. And it's actually the females, like I mentioned earlier, that are dominant within hyena society. And to be dominant, you typically need size and strength. So the females are bigger than the males, which is very interesting and against the norm in nature. Because this older sibling isn't fully grown yet, I wouldn't hazard a guess to whether it was male or female. But if it were to be a male, and the young one would male, the female would be already more dominant than it, which is very interesting. Look at this. Really putting on a show here for us this morning. One or two notches in its ear, but still relatively 
unscathed at this stage of its life. If we get another view of the, the adult female shortly, you'll notice she's got a lot more character and expression on her face due to the scars and notches in her ears from countless interactions with, with other predators. Looks like she had a tough night out and very challenging time for any animal is, or any f if female or pregnant mother is, is now when they are heavily pregnant. They're carrying all that extra weight and responsibility. So she deserves some downtime, which she certainly is getting right now. Let's see how long it takes before the youngster decides to bother her and interview. Oh, here comes another hyena. Wonderful. This one's showing quite a lot of excitement. Let's see what happens here. Just going to keep quiet while this event un unfolds. But very typical greeting by lifting up the tail, they present their anal gland, which similar to dogs, they use for telling one another's mood or social status and we heard a little bit of their vocalization and audio there which was really wonderful there's another hyena coming into the frame as well so things are heating up here It'll be very interesting to see if it continues and heads off or if it lies up nearby. And interestingly enough, the, the second individual to, to join this, this area now has not gone up to the alpha female to greet it. So, well, this one's got a little wound on its flank, on its left flank, a little scratch. I got gently tumbled over there. Now for me it's hard to read into what's just happened because like I say the one individual greeted the, the alpha female who was lying up and the second individual wasn't interested in, in any greetings. And they do appear to have continued on their way. So whether they're part of the same clan, but due to a state of pregnancy, they've moved off or aren't kind of tolerated at the den now, or whether they're from a different clan, but accept one another's presence, I'm not too sure. I think it might be worth us following them and seeing what exactly happens and that way we'll get a better idea of what exactly is going on with them. <coughs> well we really have lucked out this morning with the hyena. 
We arrived before any of them, and subsequently five have come along to entertain us. Oh, they're vocalizing. Let me try and get to them quickly. They are vocalizing, folks, and I'd love you to hear that. I'm just going to stop so we can try and get the audio. Wonderful. Okay, now that you've had a little taster of what it sounds like, I'm going to try and get us a little bit closer so that we can not only hear it better, but also see them vocalizing. It's a very interesting call to, to witness. They lower their heads and to quite a strange stance or position when they vocalize. One more time. One more time for us, please. This one's got quite a few scratches on both sides. Now I can see one on this side. As it walked past earlier, we noticed a small scratch on its left flank. What it's from, it's hard to tell. Could be other hyena, lion. Not likely leopard, but potentially. Yesterday morning, on the way in, we noticed, on the way in to, to, to work, we, or to work, uh, we noticed seven hyena walking past, not far from here, but they, they did hit off. In probably the last them past went. So that is why I, I did kind of hazard a guess that they could be different clans. The other member that I can see now further down the road is a considerable distance off. So who knows, maybe they distant distant relatives and accept one another's presence. Really so happy to have heard that audio earlier. Let's stay with, let's stay with these two and see where they take us. Again, I am interested to understand the dynamics we have just missed because it would be interesting if they are in different clans yet do greet one another so welcomingly. It'll be interesting to see how these impala react. We may hear one or two alarm calls, but because they have seen their other member pass by earlier, they may already be comfortable with the fact that they know there's a bit of a threat around. And for most of your prey animals, once they know of a threat, the risk to them becomes considerably greater. All predators rely on the elements of surprise and ambush in order to catch their prey. So, just like you saw from those impala, they just watched intently, they knew what they were up against and backed themselves, and rightfully so. They've evolved over the ages to escape being eaten. 
and it's certainly not an easy task for any predator to take them down. If anybody watching has got a special ritual, a hyena dance or anything that they know, please perform it now because we really would love to see them vocalize again. Considering the direction these two are moving in, they're not heading in the same direction as the seven individuals that I, I, saw, I saw yesterday passing by in this area. Um, the moment we're kind of heading north, and the clan that I saw the other morning headed in a more westerly direction. They could just be taking another route home though. Either way, I'm happy being escorted by two hyena this morning. Wherever they want to take us, I'm not too concerned. Just nice to be with them. It really is such an awesome animal and it'll be so interesting to know more about their life on a daily basis. I think a hyena journal would be a bestseller because they live a life of a lot of excitement and encounters with some of the animals that we spend our time hunting down to show you guys, lion and leopard. These guys often have the same, same intentions as us. Oh, that flea was seriously getting on the hyena's nerves. <laughs> they had to stop what it was doing to try to get rid of it. such an effortless running style that they have and again highly adapted and and required for their lifestyle they they need to cover huge distances in order to be able to find potential food sources and got a question the other day actually regarding this um, their back legs are shorter than their front legs and this is to aid in their moving great distances. By having longer front legs, their chest cavity is enlarged and therefore their organs are, are very big and big lungs make long distance running a lot easier. Look at them sniffing the air. It's not uncommon when following tracks of a, a leopard or lion that closely behind you have tracks of hyena. So a very useful animal for us to follow because their senses are far greater than ours. Now they've headed off on quite a prominent path here and I am gonna do my best to follow them. It's gonna be difficult because it is very thick but who knows, there could be something interesting not far from where we are. 
I feel that we are not going to be successful, though, just to warn you. But certainly worth a try. We've already lost sight of them, but let's just keep heading in the general direction for a, a short while. I can see the path that they are following, so that, that will help us. See them there? Jason spotted them, so he's helping guide me in the right direction. Okay, well done. We're back on this path that they seem to be following. Were well, they further to the left, buddy? Okay. the vehicle by that little thorn bush. Left a few holes in my jacket for memories. Well, can you copy me? Come on, I was just testing it. We still have cons. So we have had a few brief glimpses of them. We haven't lost them, but they kind of keep just ahead of us, out of shot. I really am excited to see where they could be taking us. If it's another den site, wouldn't that be nice? Again, folks, it's to know that simply pop up once we've passed over them, so we are not killing them. It's important to know. know the different trees when you are driving off road because some of them, if you drive over, will guaranteed give you a puncture. So we do know what we're up against and which ones we should drive over and which we shouldn't. I think we're approaching another road shortly. Which means they're potentially just taking a shortcut. Yeah. Oh, we've got some very interesting tracks back on this termite mound. We'll come back to that, though. Can you see them? Big hole, like a dead hole. Yeah, no. Cool. We're just going to carry on looking to see if we can see these hyenas, and then I'll come back to something very interesting that we've just passed. There was an animal that we very seldom see, if ever. I've never seen one in the Sabi Sands that was busy doing its business on that termite mound, I'm guessing last night. But it's just tracks that we can see of that animal, so we can head back to it after we've established where these hyena may have gone. OK, 
Okay, well, judging from this road, there are no tracks of the hyena that we can see here. Which sadly means, I think, that is that for now, in terms of the hyena. Well, what a great sighting we had with them this morning, folks. Um, to be waiting at the den sites as they arrive back with the mother and the, the small, two small siblings playing around. The mother relaxing, rightfully so. I'm sure she had a busy night out, or at least it looked like she did. And then to have those two other two individuals come past, one of which greeted the mother, one of which didn't, and then head off. I mean, by the time we lost them, they'd probably already moved a mile away from the den site. So I can't help but think that they're from different clans. So very interesting to see that they would tolerate one another's presence and not only tolerate one another's presence, but actually greet one another. So... We'll have to keep monitoring that closely. Sorry, I'm covered in spider webs. Um, but yeah, let me head back to those tracks we saw on the termite mound and interpret what went on there. Oh, quickly, try and get that bird. Uh, that is the black, that is the black bellied busted doing its parachuting mating display. Awesome. So, not its, its typical mating display, I actually take my words back there, I got a bit excited, I hadn't seen one doing that for a long time, but they do do that parachuting float as a display, their mating display is uh, a lot more intense in that they shoot straight up vertically and then tumble down out of the sky just before parachuting for a short landing. Um, but that is the, the bird that does the funny the champagne bottle popping, which some of you that have been watching uh, following us more closely would have seen that in the last few weeks. And we'll be sure to see it again. The, the, the breeding season for these birds is kind of beginning to, to heighten as, as the few weeks roll on. I actually haven't seen any of them doing their proper mating display yet, which indicates that they're not quite in full swing, but they are warming up. Warming up their, their skills or honing their, their techniques when it comes to courtship. So I think what we are going to do is I'm going to leave it up to you guys, the viewers, to take a few guesses as to what animal was active on the termite mound that we are about to, to go back to. So we'll get Jason to zoom into the, the tracks or signs left by that animal and give you a few minutes to, to put forward some guesses as to, to what animal you think it was. I've already given a few clues. notice that soil just from the color it's very different to that of the rest of the termite mound and also indicates that it is quite fresh a fresh digging well, I'll wait a few moments for your guesses to come through um, Jason will just let me know when they do because I want to take my earpiece off so that I can have a closer look because potentially you can actually distinguish between male and female of the species by looking at the, the tracks left after they've excavated.
in this case, I can't actually... Okay, folks, well, thanks very much for all your guesses, and some of you were right, some of you weren't far off. The answer is the ark isn't known as an anteater. It's a very, very interesting looking animal. So, this is it, and like I said, we very seldom view them in area to come up, we believe, in this area, kind of anywhere from 9 o'clock until 3 o'clock in the morning or 4 o'clock in the morning, the hours at, at which none of us are really out in general, hence us never seeing them. Um, they feed on ants and termites specifically and that's exactly what this individual would have been doing behind us it would have excavated and I think it realized after a while that potentially that excavation that it was making wasn't producing any results for it that's why it, it didn't continue to excavate um, and the way the way that you, I mentioned you could distinguish between male and female the male often leaves a de depression from the genitalia resting on, on the sand. So, just an interesting little thing that you can actually tell male or female. You can often also see a line where their, their long tail has, has depressed the sand, but in this case we do not have that luxury. So, very long claws, purposely designed and built for digging. Um, we, we see their tracks fairly often along the roads. Again, um, they are rare, and you can see from in the book over here, they've got very long claws which aid in their ability to dig into these termite mounds. The termite mounds become very, very hard. I wouldn't say as hard as cement, but you can almost drive a vehicle over these without them collapsing, which is quite a feat considering just tiny little termites have used mud in their own saliva to create such a solid structure. Um, but the aardvark are armed with tools which enable them to, to get into these holes, these termite mounds. Um, sadly, the last one I heard of being seen in the Saabi Sands was actually up a tree um, that had been killed by a leopard. And typically the view are very similar to, to that. Um, often leopard are the culprits for killing them and putting up a tree and that's the only time we, we sadly get to see them. Um, pangolin was another question that or uh, another answer that was put forward. Um, again, uh, not far off, they, they do excavate but not nearly um, as powerful and or as large as the aardvark so not as effective. Let me show you guys a picture of a pangolin quickly while we're on, on these more rare species that we see less often. I've only seen one of these in my entire guiding career and that was in the Sabi Sands and it was a, a very cool cool occasion. So feed on also, also ants and termites but they've got a, a, long, a long, thin tongue that allows them, also similar to the guess, they also have a very long, thin tongue that they can probe in down the little tr tunnels that the termites have made once they've excavated enough. Um, but their excavations aren't nearly as, as prominent as these in terms of the ones I've seen. This a leopard will not be able to, to kill. I've, seen footage of, of lion and leopard kind of playing soccer you could say with these pang that roll up into a, a tight ball and they've got this armor plating that protects them from any predators so a very unique design and impenetrable design that allows them to not have to worry about too much out here 
cool, folks. Well, well done to all of you who answered aardvark because, or anteater, that was the correct animal. And maybe we need to get you guys a job out here tracking for us, helping us find these elusive animals. Okay, sure. Well, from heading to the hyena den site, to start off with, we've got, got taken on a little roller coaster, which is great. And now I think we should continue and potentially find out what Pete's up to. It's already been an hour and I'm sure he's got uh, some... Sorry, could you go again with that message please? Okay. Oh, great. So, morning, Sheen, and welcome on board. Thanks so much for, for posting that picture of Anderson, I believe, was the, the leopard's name, um, and the aardvark that he killed to reaffirm the, the situation that most often people see aardvark in like I mentioned. So thank you so much for posting that. And interest, I'm very interested to know, Sheen, did you, did you take that picture yourself? Because you obviously named the safari and seeing these rare things really helps us to get a better understanding of of, of what goes on late at night that we don't know about. So thank you, Sheen. And I would be very interested to know where that was and and any more information you have about it. Okay. Matthew on Twitter's just asked a question. Morning, Matthew. Um, asking if there's any aardwolf around. And again, because this is a less documented or, or less well-known animal, I would like to get it out in the book to show everyone what it looks like. Um, sadly, we do not get aardwolf in this area. Um, it looks very much like a hyena, but it is, is not actually in the hyena family. And it also, despite its appearance being dog-like and hyena-like, it also f feeds, just like the, the pangolin and aardvark, on termites and small insects. But we do not get them in this area of South Africa. They do have quite a large distribution if Jason pans across to the distribution map. And interestingly enough, according to this distribution map, it says that they do occur where we are now. Um, again, just another a good example that you cannot believe everything you read in a textbook. They are obviously hugely valuable for us and giving us information, but we don't get aardwolf in this area, that I can show you, despite actually being indicated to us here on the distribution map. Um, funnily enough, the, the previous question asking whether I'd seen brown hyena, and I mentioned that I'd, I'd seen one in the, in the Karoo, a semi-arid desert area within the central southern Africa. Um, the last time I saw a brown hyena was also in, in the same place where I'd seen the aardwolf. So, yeah. Sadly not here, sure, but a very interesting animal. And hopefully we'll be doing some safaris in different areas at some stage where we will be able to show you these different critters. Um, like I said, it's probably time to check up on Pete. I'm sure he's got some... Some interesting stories about his past hour or 
some good plans up his sleeve. So across to Pete and have a good time. We'll see you later. Well, um, welcome back this side and lovely time with Scott. It's fantastic to hear about those hyenas. Um, Will was just updating me that you saw quite a few of them and also some interesting behavior. Um, always interesting animals. Uh, in fact, I, I can never quite really, you know, they, they surprise me all the time with the differences they have in, in how they interact with each other. And um, yeah, we're having a lovely drive. Uh, me and myself, I think in the last 20 minutes or so, has probably three or four times mentioned how nice the the climate is yesterday afternoon as well as this morning. It's just been this beautiful weather. Um, it's, it's just to cut jackets off, but it's almost cool enough for jackets still. So it's this perfect sort of driving around conditions. Uh, I haven't seen that much. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. Some impala, giraffe in the back. Uh, not too much going on. And we're slowly making our way. Uh, I'm still still sort of in two minds really to um, to Aratusa, but also I'm listening to the radio. This is a lovely area, open area. Uh, the guys are following up on those lines from last night. They haven't found them, but um, tracks. But the, well, I guess not such a surprise considering what we've seen the last few days from them. But um, no, no signs there yet. But I'm keeping my ear. On that, and I'm thinking of maybe going into that area to go help look. It's quite a thick block. Uh, not far from where we had the elephants yesterday afternoon, so that might be an option as well. But we'll see how it develops just now. We're going to stop at two dams up ahead. Maybe there's something happening there. The other thing that you saw with Scott was the, um, the art park digging and, the, and I presume you could see the tail mark and the sand and things like that. Again, because it's rained so nicely, it's nice and wet and there's lots of termite activity so it's perfect conditions for them. We actually did exactly the same while we were driving. I showed VM. No, it just looked like a something for a moment. I see a few places where the art park have been digging. Another bit of news for especially those of you that follow the cats closely here, um, again from the radio, it's not in our area, it's further south of us, into Little Gari, which is on our left at the moment, um, to the southern area, and then further down Hoffman's also to the south. Welcome back folks. So I think Pete was just going through a little bit of a dip there so we lost his transmission. Um, Jason and I have decided to try and head into an area that I've been spending a lot of time working for Leopard um, and I've yet to succeed in my missions. Um, 
but no other vehicles have been out here this morning so it was kind of the last area where i personally saw tracks of a female um, assuming it, it it was karula um, so we're just going to continue to to work this area in the hope that we find some sign that she's on the move or in the area if she made a, a kill of an adult impala she could feed on that for three days easily so it's coming to kind of three days potential i think this is the fourth day after i last saw her tracks so who knows hopefully she did make a big kill fill up her belly but now is required to be on the move again Having said that though, the, the likelihood of her killing an adult impala at this time of the year would be least likely than, than any other time of the year, simply because there are so many young, young calves around which do provide a, a, a much easier meal. So you typically find that most of your kills at this time of the year are young impala, but that's not, not to say that she couldn't kill an adult. And becomes tightly bonded with 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 one another and, and therefore harder to see tracks so after a few days and the soils kind of loosened and dried out it then becomes easier to see any depressions from animals walking on the road and we're getting to that stage now after the night before last's monsoon the road is beginning to loosen up a little bit allowing it us an easier opportunity to see you'll be able to get the end of its tail and maybe it'll come out again to, oh no it's just gone in we just saw a lizard called the giant plated lizard slid into its tip it was living So without these termites, not only would we have a lot of unprocessed dead plant matter, which will not get recycled into the, the nutrient cycle, but we would have a lot of homeless animals wandering the dusty dirt roads of Juma.
so it's fair to assume that this termite mound is no longer active living in the soldiers within the termite colony would, would not tolerate any unwelcome visitors so this is an old termite dormite termite mound that is now being inhabited by some lizards and who knows what what else i mean there could be burrows on the other side of the hole other animals might might, might share termite mounds together We'll give it another minute or two because it would be cool to see this lizard. You don't see them very often. And I'm pretty sure the the warmth given off by these UV rays, not that there's many right now, would lure this lizard back out. It's about uh, 12 inches long body six inch, tail six inch, as a rough rule, just to give an idea of how big the lizard is. This is always a, a difficult thing when guiding, is deciding how long to invest in the possibility of an event unfolding. And the catch is that the longer you spend, the kind of more invested you become and more likely to be in a situation that you don't want to leave until something happens. So now I'm just kind of trying to balance and make a decision as to get out of here now or spend the next hour and a half waiting here scratching our heads so that is the question that I'm asking myself but I think it's a wiser move to move on um, I'm not feeling lucky about this but we will keep our eyes peeled and at least we know where it does live now so next time we come here we can be a little bit more stealthy in our approach and hopefully get a visual of it. So this is on Aubrey's Road. Next time I'm driving down Aubrey's Road, anybody that wants can remind me to make sure we stop and see if we can get a better view or a view rather of that lizard. Really, I'm enjoying this cooler weather we've been experiencing over the last few days. Because this time of year, it can be seriously hot and sticky. that piece of ground and we why don't you go back and catch up with you later.
right, guys, welcome back. Let me show you what we, we've come looking for those lines. The guys looked around earlier. Sorry to say, hello, welcome back in the vehicle. Uh, VM's just gonna show you, actually VM spotted them. Um, the guys had this lion track this morning going into this block. It's a very, very thick, difficult area to sort of, uh, to, you know, to get into. And those vultures look like they've got something in mind there. Now, we've just seen this and um, I'm just trying to figure out what the closest point to that would be. Because they're literally about in the middle of this block and it's quite a big block. I think the point, closest point might just be straight there from here. If I go further in here, it just gets thicker. Guys, we're going to go cross country because I've got a very good feeling. And this is from um, Sean and Cedric, two guys from Aratuza Lodge. They picked up the tracks this morning. You remember we saw them as well on the drive. And they went into this block and they, you know, they've got the benefit. They're working in teams with their tracker. So they're two guys and also they can leave their guests in the vehicle for a bit. So they did a bit of walking around, but they didn't actually find anything. So stick with us. It's going to be slightly tricky terrain, it's some thick bush, but um, it's not impossible. Those lions have killed again and those vultures have all disappeared just like that. That's amazing. Oh no, there they are, there they are. Got a bit of an animal footpath here if you look very carefully in ahead of me, so that's good. We'll stick with that for now. It's going in the right direction, it's going where we want to go. It would be amazing, just imagine that. It looks like the same place. Sometimes you also catch them and they're just busy sort of riding the thermals, you know, catching a bit of an updraft, but this specific area that we're in now, it's it's not up against like a steep side where you can get bit thermal. So again, I don't think they're circling there for the sake of of lift. I think they're circling there because they're seeing something. on it. This one doesn't. Try and keep an eye on them. But they are one of your best allies when it comes to finding lions. I mean with leopard, it's more finding uh, either squirrel. Um, obviously because lions they've got the big carcasses and because they stay two days three days four days sometimes in the carcass you can look for those guys let's just show again there's the, the vultures still be getting closer we're about uh, I'd like to say halfway but almost halfway to uh, to where they are but you can see nice and low now just above the tree line It's still pretty much the same area. So it's not like you know, if they were catching thermals, if they were just gaining altitude, then that position would have changed a bit. And well, I can see it, but pretty steady.
Can you have a stick at the back there for me, please? Just about to say we're having really good going and then I would have been speaking too soon because we sort of have to find little places to weave through here because it's quite thick stuff in many parts of this. Hey man. Brilliant. Scott's found some other big game. We're going to keep finding our way through this because it might take a little while. And I'm hoping that we find what we're looking for. It might be, it might not be. But uh, enjoy the big animals with Scott and we'll see you back here with some updates in a bit. Folks, welcome back. We really are having... A wonderful morning here with on Jiga. Every corner we go around, we seem to be finding something interesting. And here we have a bull elephant. It seems to be only one individual, which isn't uncommon. And he's busy chewing on the, the branches of a marula tree, which he's standing below. Can be such peaceful animals and right now he is evidently in a very peaceful and relaxed mood it is a wonderful time of year for elephant they've really got a buffet of of options when it, it when it comes to the different food sources that are available to them And I guess just like us, good food and a full belly, you halfway to be a happy individual with not too much to worry about. He's got some decorations you can see, playing with his food. It's not frowned upon in the animal community to play with your food so, or use it as decorations. Maybe he knows something we don't know. Maybe there's a breeding herd around that he's busy getting dressed up for here. The texture of their skin really is kind of hypnotizing. You can get lost in all those wrinkles. I love following the different pathways that they, they follow. And right now he's feeding on predominantly the bark of the marula tree, it appears. You can hear that crunching and chewing and they've 
got very well adapted teeth or dental structure to process bark and branches and as far as I'm aware now they, they're predominantly feeding on the, the bark and in the next month or so as the marula fruits begin to ripen and drop down they will change from the bark to the fruits which I think is fair to say one of their favorite meals. Let's see if we can reposition now that he's disappeared out of view. What we'll do is we'll kind of try and preempt or presume that he's heading to the next marula tree. So we'll go and wait over there and see if he doesn't come over to us. Sniffing the, sniffing the ground. I noticed yesterday on Peter and Hayden's drive one had dug up a bulb to feed on and it looks like it may be doing the same thing for us now which would be very, very fortunate. Um, so obviously their trunk is their nose and there you can see him sniffing different patches of soil, investigating what may be lying beneath the surface. Look at that, really cool. And like I mentioned earlier, he did seem very peaceful and just judging from the proximity he walked to the vehicle there and the attention he gave us, he is not looking for any trouble today. Keep looping ahead of him and wait for him to do those beautiful walk bys. We stop now to feed on some grass shoots and they do vary their diet greatly as they go. Very interesting to see there how almost halfway through pulling up a certain certain sapling and then decided against it. He had literally wrapped his trunk around it and then decided against it. Now he's found something else that he has taken a, a liking to. And you'll notice how he kind of dusts it against his chin on the way up, getting all the soil off and then pops into the mouth. You'll notice his left tusk is sort of small piece that's been worn. And just like humans, elephants are either kind of left-handed or right-handed. So 
Judging by the way on his left tusk, you would... Yeah, well, it's got to assume that he's left side dominant. Just like me, I'm also a lefty. He is very close to us now, folks. This is very special. He's probably two meters from the vehicle with not a worry in the world. Sadly, due to his proximity, it's making forming difficult for, for Jason. But he is moving around into a better position. Oh, he just got a bit of a fright. But now he should be back in view. Questions just come through from Marlene on Twitter asking if the elephants get drunk on the marula fruits um, that they should be feeding on in, in, a, in a few weeks' time as they start to ripen. And as much as I'd like to say yes, that the elephants can have a little bit of a party out here, they do not get drunk on marula fruits. It was due to a film, I forget the name of the film, that was filmed quite a, quite a while back. and. They actually used a sedated elephant, which appeared to be tipsy, to portray the story of a drunk elephant from eating the marula fruits. Um, they don't get drunk. The reason being simply is that the marula fruits do not ferment and therefore turn into alcohol. Um, if, they had, if there was yeast and we were to brew some marula beer, which is a a local favorite amongst the Shangan or Tsonga people that live in this area, then sure, yes, if it, it drank enough, it would get drunk. But without the fermentation process, the marula fruits do not have an alcoholic effect on the elephants or any of the other animals. And it would be very interesting to know how much an elephant would need to consume of the marula beer in order to get a little bit tipsy because this individual is probably a five ton animal so relative to our body size it would need to consume many many marula cocktails in order to get the desired effect but thanks for that question marlene um, the animals archer don't However, get the urge to to drink any alcoholic beverages. It would be interesting being out here in the wild under the influence. I guess if I was to be one animal under the influence in Africa, it would be an elephant because you don't have too much to worry about. So to continue to kind of elaborate on the marula tree and the marula fruits, they are eaten by a lot of different animals, not only elephants. The squirrels will nut of them. A lot of the primates would obviously also enjoy these fruits. And us as humans enjoy, also enjoy the marula fruit. They can be very sweet and tasty and they've got an exceptionally high vitamin C count, higher than orange. Okay, wonderful. What we have here in the tree just above the elephant's head, there it goes. It was a little black bird called the forktail drongo. And we did try and get a, a visual of one the other day with Jason and he did it It 
a good job to do to do to do what he did in terms of capturing the moment, but it was quite a way off. So what the forktail drongo does, it's a little blackbird, is it it's often follow associated with following large herbivores. The forktail drongos know that by following them, their chances of an easy meal are greatly enlarged because the herbivores like elephants and buffalo will chase up little insects like grasshoppers or moths and then the forktail drongo can swoop down and catch it on the wing. So as the elephant walks along, I'm sure the tail follow behind it. So let's wait and see if it does play along with us. Nothing yet. Nope. No luck this time, but there was a forktail drongo in the area. And I, I did see it catch one little insect that the elephant chased up, but obviously that was all the drongo was interested in, a little, a little snack. We are going to leave this elephant, not because of any other reason other than the fact that I decided to drive down this road in the hope of finding two interesting nocturnal birds that I saw perched in a tree yesterday when driving down this road. Um, there is a chance that they will be in the same tree that they were in yesterday. I have noticed these specific birds using set trees to sleep in during the day. And they really are cool birds. I haven't seen one for a long time, so... Hopefully with a bit of luck I can remember which tree it was. And with a bit more luck that they'll still be sitting in it. The sun seems to be poking out and the clouds burning off, which is great. If I remember correctly, the big tree that you can see breaking the horizon to the left of the road was the tree that I saw them in yesterday. I think. So let's hope for the best cheer. having doubts as to whether this was the tree. Well, if it was, they are no longer in it. That's the beauty of being out here, is that you can have a master plan in place as to what you want to do or where you want to go. And you could come around your first corner and be asked by expect and therefore Having to, having to change your plans, and that's very common. You start off with the plan A, and by the end of game drive, you've gone off a bit with changes of plans. We 
which is what I really love about you. There's only so much influence or predicting that one can do. The rest you just kind of have to take in your stride and whatever Mother Nature throws at us, we, we deal with. There's a, a hornbill up ahead on the road and it's made a kill. I don't want to go too close. So we'll stop here and see if we can get a view of it without it flying off. Looks like a beetle. And what it'll do now is it'll make sure that it's dead. Oh, and then they're very skilled in the ability to toss hey, up and then into their mouth, but sadly That southern grey hornbill did not but large. It would have been great to see it tossing it up, getting it into the right position so that they can swallow it easily. I'm fairly convinced we've just driven past the tree that they were in yesterday and they don't appear to be there but that's not to say that they're not in a tree nearby um, like I say I have noticed that they do tend to sleep in similar areas so once you know where they are they typically spend, tend to spend a bit of time in that area or in trees nearby bird I'm looking for is called a Burroughs Eagle Owl. It's, a, it's the largest owl we get in this area and they're, they're really pretty. It really is heating up now that the sun's poking out. I think we have just hit the jackpot, folks. There's a lilac-breasted roller, really beautiful bird that I think has just flown into what looks like a nesting site, a cavity in this maroon tree. And to find a nest of a bird of this beauty will be really wonderful to us to be able to follow and keep on this. We're just gonna wait here for a second. 
and see if it comes back. Um, Jason is zooming into the cavity that it landed in. And that could well be where it's planning on nesting. I've actually never seen a, a lilac breasted roller nest, but I do know that they do nest in cavities and trees. And when I saw it land on that one, I thought we had lucked out. Anyway, I can see it now, and it's perched about 200 meters away from us on the top of a tree. Um, Again, we, we won't spend too much time here, but definitely going to put that one in the memory bank. And next time we drive that road, we will this road, we will have a closer look to investigate whether they have decided to use that cavity as a nesting site. Okay, well. I'm going to be off the vehicle a bit for in the next uh, few minutes, double checking for any tracks of animals. So I think it's time to head back across to Peter and see what he's up to. Guys, welcome back this side. Let's try and show you that one as well. Very well spotted there by VM just now. Oh, don't fly, don't fly. It's always a tricky thing with birds. A lilac breasted roller. Same thing Scott was talking about just now. And one of the most beautiful and colorful birds that you see out here. And this one is probably looking for food at the moment. Lilac breasted rollers catch um, insects and they're sort of a bit sort of versatile that they can, f they'll often catch them on the ground. So this one might suddenly fly down and go catch something that he saw on the ground, a little beetle or something. But they also catch them on the wing. Now you get some, some insect eaters that are specialized or specialist in catching on the wing, like bee eaters for instance. Then you get the guys like some of your starlings, ground hornbills and so on that can feed more on the ground. I mean hornbills are a little bit more omnivorous, but um, not like breasted rollers, they sort of take whatever opportunity is available. If you look just below the roller, you'll see there looks like little green golf balls almost. Those are the marula fruits. What's that about? Cool. I wonder if this is maybe a slightly young bird, because I saw another roller flying past just now. This is quite interesting behavior for an adult to, to be calling like that. It's almost like a bird looking for adults to you know, sort of try and get some more food out of them. But those berries I was talking about, are those fruits really, they're not berries, um, are the marula fruits. And come about, probably by the, by to before the end of the live drive, is end of January or so, you'll see the elephants and the monkeys and the baboons and the warthogs and the nyalas and the kudus and the impalas and the squirrels and everything eating these fruits when they start dropping from the trees. They go like a sort of a... Uh, sort of a green yellowish or slightly yellow color when they start ripening. So it doesn't look like he's going to fly anywhere. Beautiful when they do fly, they've got these, you know, sort of flash of turquoise and blue on the wing. One of my, oh, it still is, I guess, but you kind of. Get your tongue sort of untwisted. As we used to always say, something that's not as Nick the Young or myself would say, okay guys, let's go for a drive and take a super duper lilac breasted roller photograph. For those of you that take photographs, taking a super duper lilac breasted roller photograph can be a lot of fun. So also get your tongue loose. So earlier, uh, we, we followed those vultures, but it looks like in the end maybe they just had a good thermal there. They, they were staying in the same area but then as we got closer they, they just started gaining altitude. So the lions could still well be in there. The guys that tracked them this morning are, are pretty sure of it. Um, so we'll maybe later, maybe this afternoon. 
This is a little bachelor group of Impala. It's afternoon. This is a little bachelor group of Impala. A lot of the times when we're looking at Impala, it's the breeding herds, you know, the ones with the young ones. Whereas this is a bachelor group, mostly males and various ages of males. That's sort of bigger one there on the right, the one that's sort of standing still looking towards us with the shorter horns, that's about a year old. I can see two two-year-olds. So just a mixture of different ages of Impala. And in these bachelor groups they they're preparing for the stage when they can be big enough and dominant enough to to compete for females. So these younger males would do a lot of horn sparring and wrestling, you know, sort of just practicing with the horns. And then with flint. And then when they feel like they're at the top of the sort of dominance list, then they know they can go and challenge other males for females. This happens more so in, in April, end of April, May, June. That's the rutting season for Impala. That's a youngster of about two years old now. You can see the horns are starting to get the shape. Since we're not very far from from the lion kill or the buffalo carcass, I just saw a couple of vultures again. Let's just show you the vultures again there against the backdrop of the sky. Now this is okay. Thanks, Will. I just see they're circling around again. But uh, we'll just let me know. Scott is on his way there, so he's going to follow up just to see if there's maybe, I don't know, vultures, some of those hyenas he was looking at earlier, maybe the lions come back, a lot of things can happen around a carcass like that, so he'll let us know. I'm sure you guys are having good fun with Scott, Scott's a really good guy, and um, uh, he's got a wicked sense of humor, and we've been chatting a lot around the fire with uh, HG, myself, and all the guys, really. Scott's one of those really nice, you know, good guys to have around camp as well and, and I'm sure you are having a good time with him on drives and, and I really look forward to seeing how it goes over the next month or two because I think once he sort of settles into the seats a little bit, you guys are going to absolutely love spending time with him in the bush. He's very passionate about wildlife, also very interested and very passionate about the smaller things, the tracks and the flowers and the birds and that kind of stuff and that's a great experience to have. Yeah. Encourage him, ask him questions, yeah. poke him along, and uh, I can guarantee you, you're going to have wonderful times with him. Mark Weiner, of course, is also joining not long from now, around the 7th, so it's five, six days from now. Mark will be here as well. Wind is coming from there. <laughs> we just smell that carcass, and we're about half a kilometre from there. Strong, strong smell of carrion. Um, yeah, Mark's coming out soon have a good few months ahead of you, well, a month and a half, six weeks or so. It'd be lovely to come back and we've been talking about it, Nishin and myself, to maybe take a little holiday, uh, in the middle of January, end of January. We might, if it works out, I mean, there's a lot to consider the, what we do back home, the boats and travel time, babies, you know, all those things that happen as you go along in life, but um, maybe we come and visit here towards the end of the, the lifetimes. We've had so many invites, Quibbers, Dan, Naza and yours and all the guys have always invited us to come and visit, so it's maybe time we show our kids how amazing the Sabi Sands is. But like the game drive, you have to see what happens first, that's a long way away. You've got water there, huh? Yep. Cool.
Well, we are heading west. As you can see the sun right behind us at the moment. And um, let's head up to Aratiza Airstrip. It's always a beautiful area up that side. We'll look at Buffalo Pan, see if there's maybe something walking around there, and just slowly make our way back. We've got about an hour left for the morning. So uh, we'll see, maybe we bump into something. I would love to see Shadow. We've only like a few spots of Shadow, but uh, she lives in this area that we're going to come back to. That female leopard, uh, one of the rulers, uh, first cubs actually. Shadow and Tandi. Tandi I've been lucky enough to see once since we've been here on that morning drive when I went doors. And a uh, beautiful cat, lovely to see her with her cubs. And Shadow's also got youngsters, so something to hope for. Okay, great guys, well, um, as I said earlier, Scott is heading over to those lions, or the lion kill, the buffalo carcass, and he's going to give you a bit of an update of what's going on there and show you around. So enjoy it, we'll uh, keep looking for stuff outside. See you this now. Welcome back, folks. As you can see, we've changed the scenery quite dramatically and decided to come and investigate this buffalo kill. This was the second buffalo that the Birmingham boys managed to take down um, and for some reason they've abandoned the kill last night. Nobody's been able to find the lions this morning. I'm sure Pete's updated you on that but if not that is the case and that's left these vultures with a really good opportunity but at the same time it must be quite frustrating for them because there's a lot of meat left on this carcass but they are battling to gain access to it because there's a lot of hide left as you can see on the buffalo um, the vultures in frame are certainly not the only vultures here there's probably about 50 or 60 in total surrounding us and for those of you who were watching the other day when we managed to see the vultures swoop down on that old, their first buffalo carcass that the Birmingham boys took down. I mentioned that there are three different main species that you get, or three, three species that you get here. And the ones that we have in view here are the white-backed vultures, which are the most common and kind of in the medium weight category. And then you get the leopard-faced vulture, which is far larger and better designed for opening up carcasses. They've got a much bigger bill and a much stronger body. So there are some leopard face vultures here. I saw one or two and the leopard face. Um, there's a small opening and then they can use that long unfeathered neck of theirs to really probe in beneath the skin and get as much meat off as possible. A few of the vultures were frightened off when we did come into the sighting so if we give it a bit of time hopefully more will come down to feed and I think a lot of them have fed already and are now potentially getting ready to take off. I can see some in the distance it's it's will be close to impossible for oh here comes one landing Oh, wonderful. So they're still coming from far and wide. And the message can spread hundreds of kilometers, which is hard to believe. About 60 miles the message can spread. Um, if one vulture sees another vulture beelining in a certain direction, they can see that from about three kilometers away or three miles away. And that three mile distance can keep spreading exponentially hundreds of kilometers and I've heard stories of, of vultures heading 300 kilometers uh, vultures that have got tracking devices on them for research heading 300 kilometers in one straight direction straight to a kill and that can only be attributed to their great eyesight and them seeing other vultures also beelining in one certain direction 
So with a bit of luck, we'll have a few more coming in to land. Oh, there we go. We've got a tussle on our hands. This is going to be good. They've managed to get out a small piece of the intestines and... Oh, there's two or three of them. Well, not fighting over it as much as I expected them to. Really comical birds. Especially when they get worked up and have to perform these little winged wrestles that they do. Oh, that one's getting a nice peck on the head. Sheesh. Wouldn't it be nice if a hungry leopard or hungry hyena came across this now? Then we'd be in for some action, and it is possible. I really would also like to show you the leopard-faced vulture. I'm just looking behind us in a, in a, big, in a big dead tree where a lot of them are perched, but I could see Morning, Kim. Um, welcome on board. Uh, Kim's asked a, a funny question. I'm glad, glad she's asked, and she's asking how ripe does the buffalo smell now? Thankfully, we are in a position where we are not downwind of the carcass. We occasionally get a faint whiff of it, but I would have to reposition the vehicle and get down one of it to be able to tell you exactly how it smells. Judging by how long it's been here, or well, as we say that the wind has changed and we are getting... <laughs> oof! No, it is ripe. The wind has changed just in time for you, Kim. And I can assure you that it is ripe. Extra ripe, potentially... Oh no, oof. That is... What I can assure you folks is that the smell is something that you are not missing out on being at the comfort of your own home. I'm actually going to get my binoculars out and have a closer look to see if the flies have managed to reproduce successfully, and I'm sure they have. But from this angle, I cannot see any of their larvae. No doubt if we were on the other side of the carcass, which we might go around to see just for interest sakes in a, in a few moments, but there could well be a sea of maggots in the, the chest cavity or stomach cavity of this buffalo. Good to see all the vultures coming back now. Um, vultures and their, their eating habits they are strictly scavengers um, they do not have the ability to hunt so they rely heavily on all the other predators or apex predators to provide them with situations like this where they can come in and clean up all the leftovers and that is their role in the in the ecosystem they are cleaner uppers of portions of, of carcasses that the larger predators simply cannot get to and aren't designed to, to consume. So thanks Josh. Um, 
Thanks for that question. They are, they are not hunters, though. So, without the apex predators, you will not get vultures. So Kim, even though we are getting quite a pungent smell from here, I would hate to know what it's like for those vultures. I guess for them it's the equivalent of smelling a delicious steak on the on the barbecue or a, a hearty stew on the boil. But for us, on the other hand, it is not very pleasant. Just got a question through from Anna Marie in New Jersey. Very good question, asking, why have the vault, the lions, sorry, established their own territory and are still flying below the radar? They may have felt that they've overstayed their welcome in this area and that it was time to move on. Maybe they heard the dominant coalition of male lions vocalizing last night and scared them off. Um, so those are two potential theories, one being that they made another kill, two being that they got scared off by other lions. And when I say scared off, it doesn't necessarily mean by a confrontation. It could simply mean that they've heard the dominant males vocalizing nearby and decided to get out of town while the going was still good. Um, one other potential theory is that they could be... Drink, uh, could be sleeping in the shade near a dam where they've gone to drink. I'm sure the other game viewers have followed up there though. But that is a potential thing that they've been gorging themselves now for three days on three different buffaloes and now all they want was something to drink and some time to rest. But thanks for that question, Anne-Marie. That's definitely got my brain spinning as to where these lions are and what caused them to move off. The vultures certainly aren't complaining though. I really love the way they hop around to chase one another. They really are comical creatures, these. <clears throat> now I'll try and find an individual for you that's already consumed a lot of meat. And what, what you need to look for is basically there's a large bulge coming out the center of their chest. Sometimes it's, it's feathered, but sometimes it is, if they're fed on enough, there's actually, it's just skin and that is a crop that they can fill with kilograms of meat, um, of which already some of them have done. So do keep an eye out for a, a big kind of bulge coming out the center of their chest. I did see one approaching earlier that was really displaying it well. And all you could see was the, the skin 
really stretched out from being from filling that cup with meat. There's one individual, the one kind of with a lighter feather feather color, a lighter coloration that's directly behind the buffalo's skull now that seems to be quite a bully. Kim, just to let you know, the wind is still blowing steadily towards us and the smell is still exceptionally ripe. Despite the smell though, I'm ex extremely happy to be sharing this, this moment with you guys and the vultures. Um, the luck appears to be on my side with good vulture viewing with the one two days ago of them all swooping down, descending on the carcass, and we're there to witness the initial takeover from lion to vultures, and it was really a spectacle to behold. It's important to realize those beaks can deliver a very nasty bite. So, even though it doesn't seem too serious, I mean, those little nips that they're giving one another certainly must hurt a little bit. Like I was saying earlier, the fact that vultures can travel 300 kilometers in one flight, in one straight line, in order to get to a kill. Wouldn't it be nice to know where all these different individuals have come from and how far and wide they've traveled to get here this morning? What a beautiful morning to be out soaring over this beautiful piece of wilderness that we found ourselves in. I yeah, I could certainly enjoy a day in the life of a vulture. Not necessarily this part of the day, but certainly soaring about with their massive wingspan. When the temperature is right and it is hot like now with a lot of thermals, they really have an effortless flying job and they literally just ride the thermals. There have been aeroplane pilots that have either seen vultures or sadly crashed into them. As high as I've heard, 27,000 feet. I was chatting with, with Will the other day. He said he's heard a figure of 30,000 feet. And that is a very, very difficult fact to wrap your head around because to consider that these small birds are flying at the same level as a 747 is something that you and I, well, certainly wouldn't put money on. But yeah, Will, Will, Will was saying that 747 pilots have seen them up there. Wouldn't that make you blink and rub your eyes flying a, flying a, a 747 at 30,000 feet and next thing you're looking at a vulture flying alongside you? You definitely have to do a retake to see if you weren't imagining things.
So it seems like there's two points on the carcass, one at the front, one at the back. That are the two best places to be. Hence the occasional squabble and squawk over whose turn it is to feed. Here's a good example of if Jason just pans out to the left a little bit, those two individuals, or three individuals, you can see the one on the far left, you can see that prop of meat hanging out, protruding from its chest, and that's the, the pantry where they get to store their food in times of plenty like this, and a hugely necessary adaption for them without this ability to be able to store huge amounts of meat. Imagine relying simply on another animal to having to make a kill for you in order to feed. They could go for a few days, certainly up to a week without feeding, I would guess. Um, so that bank of, of meat allows them to survive the, the tougher times. As much squabbling and squawking as that's been going on, I've yet to manage to capture a photograph of them going for one another. I'm always looking up at the wrong time. I do try and post my pictures on Facebook for any of you who are interested in, in having a, a look at how they come out. Um, I would like to share them with you considering we are sharing this moment together. So feel free to have a look on my Facebook page or like my Facebook page and that way you'll get all my updates photographically. Interesting, we've got a starling coming down here collecting the, the vulture's feathers to make nesting material. That's really cool. Um, it's just flown out of sight, but three or four more starlings have, have come into picture. I'm just going to try and reposition. Oh, it just, the one just flew off, but I'm sure it will be back. I'm just going to get into a position where when it does come back, we'll be able to see it. Um, but that was really cool to see. And another good example of no how nothing goes to waste in nature. The vultures are here feeding on this buffalo, ensuring that every last little bit of it that they can consume is not wasted. Thereafter, obviously, the maggots will continue to finish off the smaller bits of meat that are, are possible for the vultures to get to. And then just from the vultures being here and all the squabbling and squawking, they're losing a few feathers and Next thing you know, the starlings are here harvesting these feathers to take back and use as nesting material. So, it really is great to see how they are so resourceful, these animals. And I think us humans can tear a few pages out of their books when it comes to wasting and utilizing resources effectively. It'd be really nice to see how comfortable that starling's nest turns out after it's got all these fluffy vultures' feathers lined in it.
nests is shaking. The one on the top, you can see it's seriously wobbling. And these are small birds, but obviously still very powerful because they're shaking that buffalo carcass around, which I can assure you is not an easy task. Take the feathers, they tear feathers out one another, hey? That's really incredible. Not the... Okay, so we've just got a question from Josh. And it's not for me, funnily enough, which is great. Um, it's, for, it's for Jason. And the question is, what camera does he use? And it's... I think it's a Sony MPEG HD422. So that is the answer. Um, I'm glad Jason knew that because I certainly didn't. It's a beautiful looking device. And it certainly has been cat capturing some, some great footage. So um, I'm certainly happy that we've got one of them on the back of the vehicle. And that is Jason's weapon at the moment. So thanks, Josh. That's a good question. I hope you're enjoying the, the pictures that it is sending across to you. Um, It really is us, uh, worth us making the most of this, this vulture interaction and, and vulture sighting. Um, typically, to have lion kill three buffalo in three nights in your area of operation is, is not a, a common event. So it could be a month or two, who knows, before we're privileged enough to have an abandoned buffalo carcass with vultures on it. Um, I can't, I, I can't exaggerate enough how lucky we've been in the last week or so. The last few weeks since we've, since we've been out here and before I got here, Peter and Hayden really have had some incredible sightings with wild dogs making kills and wildebeest being born and great leopard sightings. Now the lions have really been performing. So we can only hope that this action does continue. Okay, folks, well, just a quick update. Um, Pete is on a leopard hunt and quite far from here. So that's what he's busy up to, and we thank him for that. Um, for me, I, whether it's myself or Peter or Hayden or anyone that's viewing the leopard, as long as it's being viewed and it's getting broadcasted to you guys, that's what's important. So that's what Pete's been up to. Um, we haven't had since Saturday afternoon I think it was so that's what he's focused on and 
I would also like to head off in maybe the next few minutes and, and make our way back to camp and see if we, we don't have any sign of leopard along the way. So we'll just spend one or two more minutes here and then head on off and see what else we can get lucky with this morning. You wonder how they don't lose eyeballs to those vicious pecs that they're delivering to one another. There does seem to be an increased intensity in their behavior at the, at the moment. Okay folks, well, I hope you enjoy that as much as myself and Jason did. Jason does have a big smile on his face. And we're gonna continue on now and we're not far from, from a, a beautiful open area with a lot of general games, so it would also be nice to uh, have a, have a follow up on the, the wildebeest calves and the impala lambs that we've seen, been seen running around some beautiful open areas. So we'll head back, back there and along the way hopefully find some other signs of leopard or anything interesting for Peter and Hayden to follow up on this afternoon. Okay. Okay, well, while we uh, leave this sighting, why don't you guys catch up with Pete and see how he's doing on his leopard hunt? Well, guys, welcome back this side. We are um, in the Aratusa area at a place called Red Dam. And got a few buffalo. Now we're just sort of taking it easier. We're sort of looking for shadow, really. Um, well, sorry, I missed that last message. It's just breaking up a bit the radio, uh, so it's just well in control. Um, these guys are probably just going to take it easy as well. It's not super hot today. It's as we've been saying quite a few times. It's very pleasant. But the buffalo, they've got their routines as well. They've been probably grazing this morning. I can see all the flies there. If we go close into these guys on the left, you might be able to see it even. A little bit far from us. And if you look very carefully around them, there's thousands of flies buzzing around them. And um, that's one of the reasons sometimes I like to... Um, that's one of the reasons sometimes I like to lie down in the water or in the mud. Gives them a bit of a break from it. As I was saying, we've been looking for shadow. They had a tracks this morning, about a kilometer down the drainage line. We've just been coming up, um, her and the cubs. Now we've seen her, I mean, yes, we've seen her in the last few weeks. We saw her that once when she was in that really thick bush. I mean, Brian could hardly get a little window through. We could see her eyes at one stage in a few spots. She is a very shy leopard, but 
find in the right time, the right place, she'll be great to see. So we'll keep that in mind for the afternoon as well. These guys are going to take it easy over here. We can just take a nice slow drive along. Maybe we still bump into, into something. I'm hoping Shadow, really. Lovely little water hole, this. Place called the Red Dam. The thing with the leopard like Shadow is um, once leopards personality really that's what it really is. I mean Shadow grew up her mother is gorilla. The area that you're looking at now there's a deep drainage line in there and you could hide you know, a battalion of leopard in there and you wouldn't see them. But um, so Shadow grew up with gorilla. As I said earlier she was the first litter gorilla had uh, that now about eight years ago or so actually almost exactly eight years ago. They were also born around December. So Gorilla had the two cubs, we used to call them Saseka and Tingana. Saseka is now called Tandi, it means exactly the same thing, it's just the Shangan and the Zulu. Um, Saseka or Tingani, um, Saseka or Tandi, sorry, means beautiful, and she's a very beautiful cat. Right, let me quickly, while I'm talking about them, let me quickly show you what, what uh, Tandi looks like, just so you have an idea. I'm just going to quickly do the... There we go, that's Tandy. Let me just see if we can get you a view in there. There we go. Now Tandy, as you can see, really nice dark markings. That's yours. So it took me in there to see her. Wait, where is it now? There we go. So that's the, the sister of the one that we're looking for currently. Cool. Um, beautiful cats, eight years old, in their prime. The point I was getting to is that Shadow, her sister, who we used to call back then Tingana, meaning shy. Uh, Shadow again. The name that the guys picked for her in the west which is the name that stuck over time uh, shadow was also because she's like a shadow you know you can see her now and then she's gone um, and they grew up with the same mother Karula being a very 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 comfortable very relaxed female uh, the same as her mother safari was and uh, and always even as youngsters she wasn't shy that she'd hide all the time I mean, i've got some beautiful photos of her my favorite probably uh, i remember we still played with it same mother same experience of the vehicle is exactly the same as Tundi, but yet her nature is different. And it's always interesting to consider that with animals, that they really do differ from, from each other in terms of their sort of approach to things and how they operate. It would be nice to see her though. It would be nice to see her cubs as well. Um, two very special cats that for me. Uh, both of those actually. Let's take this road across. Go past Impala Plains, I know Scott was here earlier on today, but you never know, things can change in seconds, never mind minutes and hours. Sorry, Liam, this particular 20 meters of road is probably the worst piece of road here. It's got these really bad bumps. Some warthog tracks, some hyena tracks. Not 
too much in the clearing today. Often get impala here, giraffe every now and again, zebra, all the best. But today just beautiful sunshine. will happen this afternoon. I was partly wondering it from a, a weather point of view really, it's just looking at skies. I, I love these kind of skies, you know, blue sky, puffy clouds. It's a bit of a weight to some of these clouds. They've got that little bit of a grey underbelly. Okay, awesome guys. Quickly go to Hayden, he's got something very cool and if you don't come back to us, thanks for the morning. We'll see you this afternoon. Enjoy it with Scott. Okay, folks, so we've just got a glimpse of a snake. Um, there were two Birchall starlings, which I'm sure we'll, we'll hear again now, that were alarm calling. So as I stopped the vehicle and looked in the direction of where they were kind of doing this alarm call, I saw the, the tail of the snake slither down into the base of this marula tree, um, exactly where we're looking now. So. I'm not sure if it's disappeared into a hole. I'm guessing it did. I just saw the end piece of its tail. Um, hard to tell what it was, potentially a black mamba. They are good climbing snakes, the black mamba. If not that, I would presume potentially a boom slung, which the direct translation means tree snake. Oh, there it, there it goes. Did you see it there? It reared up. Oh, that was awesome. Jeez. Oh my word. Okay, it's still here. It's still here, folks. It's in this long green foliage, which makes it difficult for us to see, but it literally reared up at them. Um, I just got a little glimpse of it. Um, I am gonna stand up for a second and see if I can get a bit of vantage point from being higher up. Oh. Well this is the snake that I've been hoping to see, or a snake at least that I've been hoping to see. It's just such a pity the this this undergrowth is so thick. It's appeared to be a fairly large snake when I just caught a glimpse of it rearing up at those birds as they came down to mob it. But hopefully they'll, they will come down and help us find it again. Sure. How many? Uh, we don't have much time left here. Um, what to do, what to do. It is right here. Hard to believe that it's just in this grass, or this undergrowth rather right next to us. Oh. 
Where is this guy slithered off to? Did you get to see it there, Jason? Not in the monitor, but I saw it in real life. Did you? Yeah. What do you think it was? Black Mamba. Really? Yeah. Oh. Okay, folks, for those of you who don't know, Black Mamba is kind of regarded as the most deadly snake, or one of the most deadly snakes we find in this area. They've got a highly neurotoxic venom, which basically shuts down your, your nervous system and all your organs. Um, that's why I'm not out here looking for it. <laughs> Um, if it was a less venomous snake, I'd potentially try and have a closer look to see where it was, but it's certainly not worth taking a chance with this snake. Um, let's drive around a little bit. No, I don't think it's the right thing to do. It's, the undergrowth is too long. We could drive over the snake and, and put it in a situation where... Oh, there, there it goes up the tree. There it goes up the tree. Awesome. Now we're going to see it. Now we're going to see it. Um, Jason, if you focus on, you see that horizontal branch? There it goes, into the hole. Can you get it there? There it goes. There it goes. Well done, Jason. So you can see its body there, and it's just slithering back into that hole. Oh, wow. So that is what the back half of a black mamba looks like folks and not the best visual but a visual nonetheless and I'm just so excited that we finally got to see a snake on camera and it could be going back into the starlings nest right now um, to try and get their chicks that's why I think they were alarming at it um, they will alarm at any predator to try and protect their species and let other herbivores know um, but sure, that was a rush. Um, so folks, from myself, Scott Dyson, um, thanks very much for, for following and joining us on the safari. Um, I really enjoyed myself this morning and I hope you guys did too. A highlight for me was certainly seeing this, this black mamba and... Jeez, it just goes to show that even though we know it's right here, they can be difficult to see. So, what a privilege, folks, and hope you have a wonderful day, and join Peter and Hayden this afternoon. Have a good one.